Hello, folks, and welcome to the season premiere of ANCS 202, The Roman World. And let's get right to it, shall we? Behold! The Roman World, or at least part of the Roman World. However, you may notice that somebody is conspicuously absent from this map. <clears throat> that would be the Romans. This is a map of what the Roman world looked like before Rome began its expansionistic binge fest. So we're going to be talking in this class about how that happened, who the Romans are, and what getting control of the greater Mediterranean area did for them and did not do for them. Uh, one of the morals of this story is that gobbling up large amounts of territory does not gain one happiness, which is really a lesson we could all benefit from. So if you were planning on a massive binge of imperialist conquest, maybe think about spending the rest of your life singing sea shanties on TikTok. You'll probably bring more joy to the world. Okay, but First, we're going to talk about location, and one of the things you may notice about this map is that although we don't see the Romans on it, in fact, the Romans in this period are a, a tiny little dot like, like here, sorry, I got them too far into the Apennines on the first go, it's a tiny screen. There are lots of other people who live here in the Mediterranean Ocean. Or rather, sorry, sea, it's a sea. So here we're looking at the Mediterranean Sea, uh, an internal sea that's bounded by three or two continents, depending on how you feel about Eurasia. So there is Europe to the north, Asia to the east, and yes, they're connected by land, but we'll get into reasons why I'm gonna talk about them as separate things for now. It's a Mediterranean-centric way of looking at it, is, is the why. And then Africa on the south. One of the things we often forget about the Roman world is that one third of it is in Africa. Romans, not necessarily European. Also not necessarily white. I'm just going to put that here at the outset, <clears throat> no matter what the internet has told you. Okay. So Rome is bounded on the north by Etruscans, on the south by the Oscans. You see the Illyrians, Celts, Thracians. And these aren't even like coherent nation states. Some of these are just linguistic groups with a bunch of different politically independent cultures and states and city states within them. Carthage, for instance, it looks like Carthage owns this huge chunk of North Africa and Spain, but it's one of several peoples living in North Africa at this time, including the Numidians, the Berbers, the Mauritanians, and see where I'm going here. The Mediterranean is an incredibly diverse area, all kinds of different language groups and belief systems and cultural practices and beliefs. And the Romans eventually are also going to be a multicultural hybrid group. It's something that's baked into their identity from the outset, and it's something that I find interesting and endlessly fascinating about them. Full disclosure, Rome's one of my permanent special interests. I love them. I'm sure this surprises none of you. They are also my problematic faves, to be fair, but you can love problematic things. Right. My point here is that Rome is growing up in an environment of great diversity, but also great competition. Uh, these are not a conglomerate of hippie peaceniks living together in peace, holding hands and enjoying each other's diversity. Uh, these are people who are constantly at war with each other, siding together against each other, like endlessly shifting alliances. So a little bit more Westeros and perhaps a little bit less Middle Earth, although Middle Earth kind of is a bunch of warring factions too. So there we are. But before we talk about who, let's talk about the geological where. 
the Mediterranean sits on the joint between two tectonic plates, the African plate and the European plate. And the African plate is still in the process of plowing into the European plate. The African plate is subducting, the European plate is where the rising is, although the Atlas Mountains in the south, um, down along here, is part of the equation. Now let me use blue since the volcanoes are in red. So astute observers who are familiar with earth sciences will notice the large number of volcanoes along the land that lies over the subdu subduction zone. So maybe not so, less, so much Iberia, but the south of France, the Italian peninsula for sure. Look at all those volcanoes, so many volcanoes. Here is Greece, the Aegean Sea, a lot of these little islands are volcanic, adorable. And then there are all of these fault zones in what is modern day Turkey moving into Iraq, where the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River Valley is at the very easternmost edge of Turkey. This is incredibly relevant to the kind of engineering developments we're going to see the Romans coming up with, because volcanism is both Rome's secret weapon and one of its weaknesses, too. I mean, that's volcanoes for you. Also, they're very cool. You are likely familiar with at least one of these volcanoes, either Mount Vesuvius or Mount Etna, or both. But those are just the mainstream ones. Uh, hipsters will recognize other volcanoes in this uh, crescent along the boot of Italy. What this means for the city of Rome is that it's built on volcanic earth as well as um, silt coming down from the Apennine Mountains, more about those later. So this means a great deal of fertility in Italy, which is very convenient if you're going to build a large city-state with a massive urban population that is endlessly hungry for grain, which is where we're going with this. So Italian farmland is fantastic, and it was a foodie's paradise in the ancient world. Similarly, the rock created by this ceaseless volcanism is easy to cut, but it cures in the presence of oxygen, so it's a wonderful building material. It's a lot of stone architecture. It's pretty affordable in the city of Rome. And when crushed up and mixed with seawater details to follow, it eventually leads to the discovery of concrete, a concrete so fantastically fabulous that we weren't able to replicate it until 2013. It's exciting. I love Roman concrete, guys. But this also means that the Roman world occasionally blows up. Inconvenient. This also explains why the same god is in charge of earthquakes, the sea, and horses. I'll give you a minute to think about why. Okay, so the Mediterranean's on a fault line and there are constantly earthquakes in the Mediterranean. What happens if there's an earthquake underneath the body of water? tsunamis. Hence, Poseidon. Uh, why horses, you may ask? Well, horses shake the ground and it's like an earthquake. Go with it. But volcanism and the tufa stone that's created by it, that's the stone that hardens in the air, isn't the only good thing and bad thing going on in the Mediterranean. Because you have long coastlines that are visible fairly far into the sea, and you have circulating water currents within the sea itself, you have a perfect situation for circular trade. And once seagoing vessels are able to go up and down the Atlantic and African coast, you also have a waypoint here at the Straits of Gibraltar for the Atlantic trade to come into the Western Mediterranean. Similarly, the Black Sea Basin drains into the Mediterranean, creating an Eastern trade route, bringing goods and services, including things like gold, opium, cannabis, you know, classics like that, 
into the Mediterranean, as well as enslaved people, because we are about to talk about a world in which slavery is part of the economic and legal system. And that's something we're going to have to sit with and deal with. Remember, I said problematic faves. This is the yeah, I'm going to say this is the number one most problematic thing about the Mediterranean. Uh, not just Romans, everybody's doing it, and that is no excuse. So, if you look here, this has the prevailing sea currents and the major ports of call. You'll see Carthage here. And Sicily and Syracuse are here. You also have, of course, Sardinia. And then along this coast here, Phoenicians and then, of course, astute observers will notice the coast of Libya and Egypt. One of the places you will not see the circulating sea trade is here, where Rome is. So Rome's about on the knee of the boot of Italy, if you need to eyeball it. This is not a bad thing, because with sea trade comes people who grab your ships and take your sea trade, that is, pirates. With sea trade and accessible harbors come people who like to land on your beach and take over your city-state. Rome is insulated from that a little bit, although you will notice a conspicuous exception. Carthage is pointed directly at Rome's soft underbelly. Those of you who are familiar with the plot will notice that I'm not giving you any spoilers. I'm just bringing up Carthage for reasons. They go to war. But in general, Rome is pretty well insulated from attack by sea. There are also mountain ranges protecting it at the back. We'll look at those in a minute. However, Rome isn't completely isolated either. It's close enough to the coast that it can participate in this trade. And it's producing enough wealthy trade goods that eventually that's going to be an economic bonus. This is something to keep in mind should you ever found your own city-state. You want to be close enough to the highway that people can engage in trade in your city-state. But you also don't want to be too accessible because pirates and invasion. I hope that will be useful to you someday. Let's then talk about agriculture. And here... I'm going to talk about the two hallmarks of Mediterranean culture that Mediterranean inhabitants bring up as the, the benchmark or the diagnostic factor in figuring out that you're looking at a Mediterranean culture, and that is the grape and the olive. This isn't just a Roman thing. Pretty much everybody in the Mediterranean is kind of low-key obsessed with grape and olive because these produce two major products that are necessary in order to engage in a Mediterranean diet and lifestyle. Both of them are processed in a similar way. Uh, olives grow on trees, grapes grow on vines, and then you process them into wine and olive oil, respectively. No, I switched the order. You can figure this out. Um, Wine is made by stomping on the grapes with your feet to induce, introduce natural human yeasts into the mash mix. And then through natural fermentation, you create the wine mixture that you then add to water as a sanitizing agent. So wine in the ancient world, I mean, yeah, you can get drunk off of it and people think that's fun. But the main thing it's being used for is purifying and improving water supplies. So it's an important safety product that does save lives. And because it's unpasteurized, there's some who think that the natural yeast molds and bacteria floating around in the wine could have had some additional health and analgesic effects. Wine contains substances that also have some health producing properties. I'm not telling you to go out and you know, drink a whole cask of it. I'm just saying that if you're living in the ancient Mediterranean where safe drinking water is something you so don't have, wine is really necessary for making sure you don't die as much. 
Now, other cultures have alcohol, and alcohol is a mainstay for human cultures dealing with unsafe drinking water, especially before germ theory, and this is before germ theory. To the north and the south of the Mediterranean, so here we're talking Egypt inland from the Nile River Delta, and northern Europe north of the Alps and insulated from Mediterranean sea trade, and in early days even Germany along the Rhine, you can't grow grapes. The climate isn't right, so you use grain, you ferment that, and you make beer. Similarly in Egypt, beer is the gold standard alcohol. Mesopotamia likes beer too. You can draw some lines, um, and indeed Romans do draw lines between beer drinkers, <laughs> barbarians, which by the way is a complicated term that we should not use casually. More about that later. And civilized people. So when um, Romans twirled their non-existent mustaches because they shaved in this period, uh, they would snark at people who used beer rather than wine in their drinking water and supply. I'm not making any judgments. I have a sulfide allergy, so I can't drink either one of them. I'm really glad we have water sanitation, though. So the olive might be a little less easy to understand, but olive is not just something that you use to cook with in the ancient Mediterranean. It's your lighting source. So olive is put into lamps with a wick, and then the burning of the olive oil in the lamp wick is what you light your homes with at night. Olive oil on your skin is your basic cosmetic. You use it to moisturize, to clean yourself. Soap was considered a luxury product and a little bit too harsh, and maybe that's not entirely wrong. Oil cleansing is enjoying a renaissance these days for decent reasons. So it's what you clean with, it's what you cook with, it's what you light your house with. It's one product that's No, I think essential is a fair way to describe Roman attitudes towards olive oil, but it's also something that olive growing regions produced in excess as a luxury project, pro bleh, produce. Same with wine. If you had dry, dry ish warm conditions that could support olive trees and grapevines. Often it was a crop that you grew not just for local subsistence use, but in order to produce extra for trade. So it's not just about your daily life. This is also the economic engine that runs the Mediterranean. Because this was considered the two pronged products of civilization, people who didn't live in areas where they could get a hold of enough olive oil and wine would trade for it. And this includes large cities in areas that, yeah, sure, they can produce olive oil and wine, but not nearly enough to support the population of their urban centers. Places like Carthage, Sidon, Tyre, Athens, and Rome, eventually. And this means that most of the products being shipped on these sea lanes are olive oil and wine. When we dig up ancient ships, not really dig, more like scuba dive to ancient shipwrecks, we find so many amphorae, that is ceramic containers meant for olive oil and wine. An amphora, you can tell that you're looking at it because it's got this pointed bottom on it. See how these shipping containers here, let me use red. So these shipping containers have pointy bottoms. That's so that the pointy bottoms can interlock with the slim necks. And this creates a shipping load that doesn't shift as the boat rocks. This creates a balanced load. It adds ballast to the hold of your ship. Lighter goods can go on top. And it's a way that you can make it less likely that you'll all die in a shipwreck. Less likely. Shipwrecks are a real problem. Here is an olive press, just to give you an idea of what this looks like. You don't use your feet on olives, generally speaking. Instead, you have these two disc-shaped stone blocks, so here and here, uh, separated on this axle. And as you turn them around, so you have somebody holding on either side, or you hitch a mule to it, 
you have the mules walk opposite each other and then the wheels they're curved so that they turn in a circle and this churning action works a little bit like a stand mixer sort of a combination between a mortar and pestle and a stand mixer and this crushes the olives and allows you to press the oil out and you can do this several times each pressing has a different quality of olive oil that you use for different purposes you light your house with the crappiest olive oil and you eat the nicest olive oil unless you're poor in which case you just get what you get however this is not all done with mule labor you also had other press designs that worked a little bit more like what you may imagine with a press where you like squish two levers together a little bit like a garlic press and for that you would use enslaved labor by the time we check in with the Romans in a couple of weeks with Cato the Elder, this is being done on large factory farms by an enslaved labor force. This here, by the way, is an olive tree. They take a very long time to mature, but then they live a really long time. They can keep on going for a century or more. You can take cuttings of a tree and then re-sprout it, and then it'll take on a new life and continue to grow and this is why if you were invading somebody in the ancient world and you wanted to be a real jerk face the first thing you might do is cut down the olive trees because that's going to set them way way back and totally smash their economic infrastructure i hope you never need that information So let's talk geography. This is going to be a part of quiz one, and this is going to be important because I'm going to be talking about these landmarks a lot. So let's remind ourselves of where these things are. I'm going to start with the seas because that's an important place to go. So the Mediterranean is what we call the mother sea between the African and the European plate. But within the sea, there are different regional seas. And that's what we're looking at here. So the Tyrrhenian Sea right here is the sea right next to the city of Rome. You can see Rome here. So it's right there under Rome's knee. The Adriatic here, if you ever knew somebody named Adria, they're named after this city. Or not, sorry, city. Sea. Duh. This is along the Illyrian coast where the infamous Illyrian pirates lived. Now, the Romans called them Illyrian pirates. The Illyrian pirates called themselves the Navy of Illyria. Victors write the history, and there we are. So we've already talked about the Mediterranean. The Ionian Sea is not on this map. The Ionian Sea is the one around the islands of Greece. It'll come up again later. But right now, let's focus on Adriatic, Tyrrhenian, and the Mediterranean. One way to remember Tyrrhenian and Mediterranean is that med root is the same root that gives us medium or middle. It's from the Latin medius, meaning middle. So the Mediterranean is the sea that's in between the terai, right? It's in between the lands. Um, the, actually no. Tyrrhenian, I can't remember the etymology of that one. Sorry, that's not going to be as helpful, but I don't want to re-record this slide. At any rate, that's a way of remembering the Mediterranean. That's also how I remember how to spell it. Every time I spell it, I go like Medi Terra Inan. True confessions. Next up, the mountains. These are super duper important because these are part of Rome's natural defense system, but this is also a frequent speed bump that Romans are going to find themselves challenged by. Mountains are a double-edged sword. Mountains are hard to cross, but mountains are really easy to hide in. I'm from West Virginia. Trust me on this one. Several of my apocalypse plans involving involve going to West Virginia and hiding out on mountain peak somewhere although that just might be cultural reflexes. So the 
Apennines go down the central spine of Italy. They're why Italy looks like a boot, because the way that the plate is buckled in this area pushed up the Apennine Mountains above the sea level, and they're what keeps Italy from essentially sinking into the Mediterranean. The Apennines begin here along the west coast of Italy, but kind of veer off a bit central and then down into the toe where there's a brief strait before they connect up with Sicily. So this mountain range is essentially Sicily. You've got another buckle ridge here that forms the islands of Sardinia and Corsica off the coast of Italy. The Po River Valley runs here. More about that in a minute. And this is a depression between the Apennines. It's kind of like a, a buckle before you get to the Alps, which is the semicircular mountain range that runs over the top of Italy a bit like a cap. This makes it really hard to get into Italy with your army and elephants. Notice I said hard, not impossible, but spoilers. But it's kind of hard to cross the Alps, and that works in Italy's favor. Italy also has this double defense because they're the Alps, but then they're also the Apennines, so you have to cross two mountain ranges to get into Etruria, which is not quite in Latium. Here's where the city of Rome is. Another thing about the Alps that's going to be very important for Rome's development is that there are large iron and salt mines in the Alps. This means that Romans have ready access to a metal that not everybody in the Mediterranean can get easily, iron, and with it early forms of steel. Now this isn't like Bessemer steel, so it's not like super duper awesome steel, but it's steel. And in a world where most folks are using bronze, Nice. This is a topographical map at an angle just to give you an idea of what this looks like from the ground level a little bit. So here Italy's been tipped on its side. So we were looking bird's eye view down. This is like, oh, if a bird were in Africa and looking up. And here you can really see what the Apennines and the Alps do for the Italian peninsula. So Rome is about here-ish. There are these hill lands in the immediate area, and then you've got this sharp rise in the northern range of the Apennines. Apennines continue down to boot. Then the Po River Valley is a highland, almost a plateau, running down into the Adriatic, and then the Alps rise even above that. So as you go from south to north in the Italian peninsula, you're going uphill pretty much all the way. So I talked about islands, here they are, Sardinia, Corsica, and Sicily. I've already mentioned they're barrier islands, they're important tactically. I don't have too much else to say about them, just behold, here they are, they are labeled. I'll be asking you about them. So next up, rivers. I've mentioned a few of these, so let's go. I'm going to start with the one I already talked about. The Po River, as I said, flows through this plateau between the Alps and the Apennines. And it's a wealthy and silty rich river valley, so agriculturally very productive. And the people living there before Rome takes custody, as it were, are what they call cis-alpine Gauls. And in Latin, that means Gauls that are on our side of the Alps. You're probably more familiar with the Latin word trans or trans. Trans means a cross in Latin. Cis is the opposite of trans, which is why there are transgender people and cisgender people like me. Cis means on this side of, trans means on the other side of. And this is one example of how Latin has helped us to come up with terminology for concepts that uh, we're becoming more aware of or that we want to talk about. At any rate, for Romans, cis-alpine Gauls means the Gauls on 
our side of the Alps, which already tells you something about the Roman frame of mind, right? <laughs> Even when Gauls are living in it, they're like, yeah, that's our side of the Alps. They're so adorably predictable Romans. They're only adorable because it's 2000 years ago and they're not gonna like come burn down my house. At any rate, Po River Valley then is in Italian Gaulish territory. If you go a little south of it, you'll notice that the Rubicon River is labeled here, but we're actually not sure where this river is anymore. And that's because silting. Geology changes over time and rivers change really quickly. And the Rubicon River, although it was recognizable 2000 years ago, today we have a general idea of kind of maybe where, but you know, even in antiquity, it was a small river. So why am I telling you about it? Well, for Romans, this was the natural border of their natural heartlands. They thought of this as kind of a, um, oh, I don't know, the uh, Canadian border, if you will. That's not a great analog, but let's go with it. If you crossed the Rubicon River, say, with your Roman army, and you did not disband them, and the Senate didn't say you could, then you were probably starting a civil war by invading the city of Rome. I say for no particular reason. <clears throat> Spoilers. Next up, the Tiber River flows southwards through the Apennines, out through the hills of Rome and into the sea. So this is the major river feeding the city of Rome. Initially, it was its water source, but medium early on, it got too polluted from agricultural runoff. By the way, agricultural runoff is a polite term for animal poop and people poop and urban trash. Uh, the Tiber River was really unsafe. The Tiber River is still unsafe. Don't drink water from the Tiber. I don't care how holy it is. Just keep it in a bottle. Don't even try mixing it with wine. Just don't. Or like boil it first. At any rate, the Tiber River then is the closest thing Rome has to a trade water thoroughfare. And I say that grudgingly because it's a very silty river. Much like the Po, it's carrying a lot of soil and debris. It floods on a very regular basis, turning downtown Rome, the Forum, into swamp. More about the swampy Forum later, before flowing out to the sea, but it doesn't have a proper harbor. So to have a good harbor, ideally what you want is a barrier island to keep the sea from rushing up into the river mouth and then you want a river that runs very deeply in a depression between two hard bits of rock so something like say Carthage Harbor or at least Athens Rome has none of these Corsica and Sardinia are not close enough to be barrier islands barrier island would be like right in close to land and there is none in fact, this was such a problem that one of the reasons Romans invented underwater setting concrete was so they could build a fake island so they could get their substandard harbor up to code. But this illustrates a bit of a point. Having less than ideal real estate does not destine you for horrible things. It means that you're going to have to work a little bit harder and get better at science to work on your infrastructure. I'm just saying. But yeah, Baltimore Harbor is so much better than Ostia. So Ostia is the name of their harbor town and also the harbor itself. And it's from the Roman word for mouth because it's the mouth of the Tiber River. Rome itself, you'll notice, is a little bit farther up the river so that it's not prone to coastal flooding, but it's still kind of marshy, which is going to be a constant issue for it. Uh, the Arno I've also included in this list. I don't care as much if you know where the Arno is, but that's the river that you have to cross to get over the Apennines into Etruria and Rome adjacent territory. So here is an overhead view of the topography around the city of Rome 
and this will tell you a little bit more of what I mean by Rome's general swampiness. Here are the Pontine Marshes, which just means the marshes along the sea, which is what a marsh is, so like what? At any rate, that's what Rome called this. They extend uh, really all the way up to the city of Rome proper, and you'll notice Rome itself is in this depression around the mountains bordering it. There are hills in Rome, so there's high ground, there's low ground, but essentially Rome itself and the area around it is a coastal marsh with a lot of standing water. And this means that Rome had a horrible endemic malaria problem up until really the 1930s when Mussolini did some major drainage projects. I am, by the way, I'm not being pro Mussolini, this is just like he's the guy responsible for this. So, I'm just saying, uh, the Emperor Nero also tried to do this, and I think he's shitty too. Sorry, sometimes I cuss a little bit. At any rate, the Appian Way is the main road coming south out of Rome. It's in yellow on this map, and you can see how it doesn't go along the coast. It's inland, closer to the mountains, and it has to do that because this marshy ground is so unstable and mucky and nasty. Now, this is both Rome's big, not biggest problem, but a big problem for Rome, but also a big benefit, because if you want to, say, sail your ship up to Rome, unload your troops, and then march on Rome, you have to do it through swamp. And as anyone from North Carolina or Georgia can tell you, it is very difficult to attack people through a swamp. This also worked out really well for ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt had a lot more going for it, though. Now, there's some fantastic real estate, guys. Oh, ancient Egypt was so freaking lucky. I want to go there so bad. At any rate, we're looking here at the harbor of Ostia, the rather alleged harbor of Ostia, you'll notice that the land doesn't dip in like you'd like to see for a harbor. That's because it's a horrible harbor. So horrible, in fact, that if you want to land your boats, you would do it instead here in the Bay of Naples. You'll notice the Bay of Naples has everything that Rome's harbor doesn't. There are barrier islands here and here. There's a spit of land sticking out from Pompeii. Herculaneum here. Messenum is where Rome's major imperial naval base was, also the place where dearly departed Pliny the Elder was in command when he died. I love Pliny the Elder, guys. Full, straight up. I, I'm like more than a little bit of a fangirl. But we're not talking about him now. We're talking about the Bay of Naples. Now you'll notice this is a lovely round-shaped crescent sort of place, and there's a lot of high ground and mountains making this a nice deep drop into the sea. That looks great, doesn't it? Except, do you know why there's this round crater-shaped area with mountains around it? It's a super volcano. That's why! The entire freaking Bay of Naples is a super volcano. Mount Vesuvius, which is just inland right here, is Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius is a sub-volcano to the Bay of Naples super volcano. But, you know, Vesuvius only erupts every 500 years, so, like, what's 500-year intervals with, like, you know, everything gets covered in a pyroclastic flow, but then you get 500 years of usable naval base? I mean, honestly, things have been built on more questionable areas. So, you know? No judgment, but part of why the Bay of Naples is such a big deal is because Rome's harbor is so incredibly crappy. You can't keep a fleet there, and Rome needs to have a military fleet eventually. So if you can't keep your military fleet next to your capital, you park it around the block. Ah, uh, yeah, so here's what I mean about Ostia being a silt fest. This is a picture taken out of an airplane, and this island in the middle of the Tiber right next to Ostia is built entirely of silt. This here is also silt. The problem with the Roman harbor is it kept filling up with silt, so it had to be dredged on a regular basis. One of the people who first drew up plans for dredging it is Julius Caesar, 
Claudius ends up actually doing it. So eventually they did manage to build a decent port. So here's how they did it. First, they built this artificial island, then these artificial breakwaters here and here, and then these artificial spits to put the docks on, and then this artificial sub harbor here. This um, is that hexagonal or octagonal? One, two, three, four, five, six, hexagonal harbor attaching up to the Tiber. You'll notice it's not right on the Tiber. I mean, it sort of is. The Tiber's here and the harbor's here. That's a move to try to mitigate the amount of silt flowing into it, but it can't be totally away from the Tiber because you need to be able to unload ships. Uh, let me use blue. Here we go. Unload ships here and transport them here to the river Tiber and then transport them down to the city of Rome to sell them. So there's a canal built in to accommodate that. The amount of engineering you have to invent in order to make this, um, oh, I've already been crass, this turd of a harbor into something usable is really quite impressive. Gold star Roman engineers. Okie dokie. So now we're into the greater Rome metropolitan area. And as I mentioned, Rome is a city with a lot of high ground interspersed with swampy lowlands. So this is the Tiber River Valley when it is not flooding. When it is flooding, use my blue pen again, the water rushes in this way and this way up to the bottom of the Capitoline, Palatine, and Aventine Hill. Sometimes it'll go all the way up to the Quirinal Viminal, like up and around here. And this meant that every summer Rome turns into a malarial cesspit. If you're a wealthy Roman, like in the Senate, then you have vacation homes in the Apennine Mountains that you and your wealthy family and the people you've enslaved to do your bidding go off and live in until everything dries out again. But for the rest of us living in the city of Rome, we are stuck there during malaria season. And the malaria problem is bad. I mean, really bad. So bad that clinical descriptions of malaria that are diagnosable and um, trackable, even to the point where we can tell which of two malarial parasites are causing the malarial symptoms, um, really, it starts in Greek medicine, but Romans were capable of identifying this as a distinct disease. Couldn't treat it. That didn't happen until the New World tree, the, uh, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but the Chincona tree, which produces quinine, was discovered with an original monopoly by the Jesuits, interestingly enough. Partly why the Jesuits were so keen on getting hold of a malaria cure can be traced back to this one papal election where all of the cardinals came to Rome to run for pope. They all got malaria and they all died and then they had to find new cardinals and do it again. It's bad. So if you're ever time traveling, go, don't go to Rome in the summer. Don't do it. And don't drink the water. And also bring mosquito netting. And quinine. Oh my gosh, though, if you had quinine in ancient Rome, you would be greeted as a liberator. Anyway, the important hills that I want to stress here are the ones closest to the river. The Capitoline Hill, which is use a different color, we'll go with red here. So the Capitoline Hill here is the ritual center of Rome. This is where the major temples of Jupiter and Juno are located, and this is where a lot of civic rituals take place. Opposite it, the Palatine Hill is eventually where the emperors live before that. This is where the wealthy Romans with really old families live. This is like the um, the Mount Vernon of ancient Rome. Uh, I'm not talking about George Washington's Mount Vernon. I'm talking about Baltimore Mount Vernon. So like if Rome is Baltimore, then the Palatine Hill is Mount Vernon and the Capitoline, gosh, is there a cathedral in Baltimore? Anyway, the Aventine is also worth mentioning. So the Aventine's out here because this is, 
it's not as fancy as the Palatine, but it's still nice-ish real estate. It starts as a place where poor merchant class folk live, but eventually it's too fancy. If you are a normal person, you might end up living across the Tiber or up on one of these uh, remote side hills, especially the Esquiline. The Esquiline is maybe like West Baltimore for Rome. And then in the areas between the hills, people are living there too, but because it floods a lot, fancy people generally aren't. Unless they're like the chief priest of Rome, but that's a story for another part of the lecture. The area between the Capitoline and the Palatine Hill, let me use green for this. So this green scribble here, is where the marketplace is. It's close to the river, which means you can load things off of barges and bring them to the marketplace. And the silting and flooding means that it's relatively flat. Now there are temples there too. This is where the Roman Forum is. So it's the marketplace, but part of why it's a business district is because the business district can be flooded once in a while. And yeah, sure, it's inconvenient, but it's not a rich person's house. So here's a topographical map of the area around Rome before it was developed, just to give you an idea of what this looked like and where the marshiness is. And you can see the marshiness pretty well in this, which is why I, I love it for an illustration. So it's, it's swampy, it's humid, it's kind of nasty, but it's also at a good location for trade because it is kind of close to the sea. It's along this river. It's downhill from a bunch of different tribal settlements further inland. And we think the city of Rome started as a market crossroads and a market town, which is why the oldest stuff we find is in the Roman Forum. And this also accounts for the class differences that we're going to see in early Roman populations. And that's what I got for you. Welcome to Rome. Next time, we'll talk about Rome's very early history very, very quickly and sketchily. And then we'll get into the details of Roman religion. What did they believe? Why did they believe it? How did they pray? How did their religious beliefs intersect with the way they set up their political structure? Find out next time on The Roman World. Welcome to the class. I'm psyched to have you guys. Oh yeah, while I'm here, I'm gonna mention, if you need an extension, ask for an extension. You can ask for as many as you need. I seriously don't mind. I know that it's a really weird, difficult semester on the end of a bunch of weird, difficult semesters. Everybody li everybody's life is going sideways, including mine a little bit. So seriously, I promise you two things. I will not be an asshole and I will help you to stay on track and balance your coursework with the demands of your real life. So welcome. I will take as good care of you as I possibly can. And I'll see you next episode.